Chairman, the live stream has been switched on and Gary has joined the meeting. Thank you, Lynn. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this virtual meeting of the Cornwall and Arza Silly Fire and Rescue Service Local Pension Board on the 28th of October. Before consideration of today's business, I will outline the protocols for the meeting. Today's meeting is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. When board members are speaking, they may choose to use their video. If the council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issue cannot be resolved, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be concluded at a future date. If a board member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short period whilst efforts are made to re-establish their connection. As I call board members to speak, I remind you to switch on your microphone. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the Democratic officer, Lynn Beardsmore, will advise you. The vote will be taken by roll call and results will be announced by the Democratic officer. Although there are no confidential matters on the agenda for this meeting, should such a matter arise during the meeting requiring the press and the public to be excluded from the meeting, board members will be required to turn to confirm and declare that there are no other persons present who are not entitled to either hear or see consideration of the matter. Where a board member has declared a non-registrable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in a matter, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they will be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. To confirm, the procedure for board members who wish to ask a question or to speak on an item should indicate by placing an X in the chat box, which I'll be monitoring throughout the meeting and voting will be by roll call. Before we start today's business, Lynn Beardsmore, our Democratic officer, will ask board members to confirm they are present and to state their role on the board. Thank you, Chairman. Starting with you, Chairman, could you please, um, Victoria Wallens Hancock, could you please state your role? Hi, I'm Victoria Wallens Hancock. I'm an employer representative and chair of the board. Catherine Billing. Yeah, good afternoon. Catherine Billing, employer representative. Deborah Goodread. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Debbie Goodread and I am an employer representative. Gary Rich. Good afternoon, Gary Rich, employee representative. And Stuart Whitworth. Good afternoon, Stuart Whitworth, employee representative. Thank you. I can confirm that the following officers are also in attendance. For the pensions team, Matt Allen, employer liaison officer, Matt Davies, assistant pensions benefits manager, and for the for HR, Teresa Brocklehurst, employee relations consultant, and for democratic services, myself as democratic officer. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'll now proceed with the meeting and start with agenda item one, which is apologies for absence. Apologies today, Chairman, from uh, Phil Martin. Thank you, Lynn. Moving on to item two, declarations of interest. Um, if anybody has anything to declare, please place an X in the box. No, thank you very much. Agenda item three is minutes of the previous meeting. If we can just have a quick look through the minutes for the previous meeting for matters of accuracy. Page one. Page two. Page three. And that ends the minutes. So can I please have a proposer and a seconder for the minutes, please, if you could place an X in the box. The recommendation is proposed by Catherine Billing and seconded by Stuart Whitworth. The Democratic Officer Lynn will now conduct the roll call vote. When your name is called, please state if you are for or against the proposal or if you are abstaining. Um, Catherine Billing. Catherine Billing for the proposal. Debbie Goodread. 
Sophie Goodread for the proposal. Gary Rich. Gary Rich for the proposal. Vicky Victoria Wallens Hancock. Victoria Wallens Hancock for the proposal. And Stuart Whitworth. Stuart Whitworth for the proposal. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number four of the agenda, if I can please pass to Matthew Davies, who will go through the report. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, just the usual business update from me. Um, nothing too exciting in there this time. Um, I know my team probably wouldn't agree with me on this, but for business as usual, it's actually been a fairly quiet period. Um, it's everything else that's causing us a problem at the moment. But um, as far as the 92 scheme is concerned for membership movements, we've had no one transfer over to the uh, 2015 scheme and we've had only one retirement. It does mean we're now down to just 16 active members now left in the 92 scheme. 10 are fully protected and six are taken protected. And I know we have got some retirements coming up, so that number's getting smaller and smaller. Uh, 2006 scheme, we're down to 22 members remaining in that scheme, which is 18 protected, uh, four tapers. And again, we didn't have anybody taper over to the 2015 scheme in this period, but we did have one retirement. Modified scheme, even less has happened. We've had no one uh, retire and no one transition over, so we're left with 22 actives in that scheme. And the 2015 scheme has been quite quiet as well. Uh, obviously, no one's tra transitioned into it and we haven't been informed of any new starters in this period of July to September. So uh, it's been, it has been very quiet. Um, just as a, a matter of interest there, on the first section on the membership, where we've got X92, X2006 and X modified. Those are the numbers that we'll be looking at when we come on to talk about remedy. So those are the people that have moved over into the new scheme that potentially will be looking at um, changing their benefits when we uh, get the full instructions regarding the McLean case. Um, Ours of Silly, Ours of Silly has almost had more action than Cornwall in the last quarter um, and they have had one retirement which was their last fully protected 2006 member. So they're just left with one taper protected member and everyone else is in the 2015 scheme. So they're now up to seven pensioners. Uh, next on the uh, report is the update from the Southwestern Wales Pensions Officers Group. Now, since the last meeting was held uh, back in August, we haven't actually had one. Um, the reason being whilst the LGA were working on uh, the McLeod remedy and the immediate uh, detriment cases, they didn't. we didn't really feel it was worth having a, a, a meeting while there's still so many unknowns, but we are going to schedule a meeting for, I said late, late October at the time of writing this report, but it's probably going to be mid-November now where we'll get together to see um, what the next steps are for us really with, with remedy and the immediate de detriment cases. Um, any questions on that at all? Okay, next is the LGA fire bulletins. There have been three since the last meeting. Uh, I don't propose to go through them all in great detail, but has anybody got any questions at all on the content of uh, those bulletins? Just one from myself, please, Matt. Um, yep. In each of the bulletins, it um, provides a, a current overview of where um, we are nationally with McLeod. Yep. So just for the purposes of the board, it would be really useful just to outline where we are with the immediate detriment um, communication that was received from the Home Office. OK, yep. So uh, that came out in August. Unfortunately, um, it came out without corresponding with the LGA. So although it provided guidance on what they wanted us to do with the immediate detriment cases, now immediate detriment cases is anybody who is uh, up for immediate retirement. So they are going to essentially be having a loss um, straight away if their benefits aren't corrected. But it didn't have the necessary guidance that we, we required to be able to implement what was contained in the note. So the LGA went back to the Home Office to state that and to ask a number of questions. 
some of those have been answered and some of them haven't. Um, on Monday, we had an update from the LGA providing us with the answers to what they did know. Um, as yet, I have to admit, I haven't fully um, looked through that paper, um, but it is looking like we are going to be um, required now to compare benefits for everybody that's retiring in the immediate future and give them the option at this stage to decide which scheme they want to receive their benefits from and to make up the contributions if required. So there is going to be quite a bit of extra work for all of our retirements because effectively we'll have to supply two lots of figures and it will have impacts on other teams because we'll be required to tell them at this stage what contributions are required, which will have an impact on the payroll team. Thank you, Matt. Does anybody have any questions in regards to that? No, thank you, Matt. Okay. Um, so oh, one thing, sorry, I'm back on the bulletins. Um, the AGM was in September and bulletin 37 has actually got a link to all the presentations. Uh, Vicky and myself uh, went to the meeting, but it probably would be worth the board having a look at those those slides and having a read and obviously it will count towards your training. Um, the next item is the schemes risk register. It can be found at Appendix 1. There has been uh, one additional risk added, which is risk 24, which is <laughs> additional work for the pensions team again. Um, Jane, which, is, which has been raised by the uh, Cornwall Council's Voluntary Workforce Reduction Scheme, which has just recently been launched. Obviously, this has no direct impact on the fire schemes, but it has impact on resource in my team because obviously we administer the LGPS as well, and this is going to create an awful lot of work for us, which will have a knock on on what we can do for, for firefighters. Thank you, Matt. Just in relation to that point, um, I'm wondering whether the risk score is high enough. Um, we've had recent conversations regarding the amount of work that is coming through that team and I believe since this report was written um, some members of the team have also left putting additional pressure on who's left so I'm wondering whether we need to log this risk um, as a greater risk um, in right. relation to those particular issues. Um, Catherine did you want to come in there? Yeah, definitely, Chair. I think as we were, as I was reading through the just the report, really, the the thoughts that were going through my head was, um, you know, recognise it, it is a risk. But I think the conversations that we're hearing outside of um, uh, outside of our own service and the wider um, and the wider kind of council is that um, a lot of times you hear, oh, I'm sorry, I can't advise on that, but please contact the pensions team for further information. Uh, and I just feel that that, that um, with that going on across Cornwall Council, that is going to impact on, on the team's uh, uh, capacity and indeed raise the risk. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I can also update that the Chief Fire Officer as the uh, Scheme Manager has also raised concerns regarding the capacity of the team and is meeting with central teams within Cornwall Council to discuss those concerns and take them forward. So I think it would be good to get the risk register to reflect um, those conversations that are happening. OK, yep, I should do that. Thank you, Matt. Um, so the next item is uh, breaches. Um, obviously, we keep a log of these and that can be found at Appendix 2. Um, since the last meeting, we haven't had any breaches um, that we've been made aware of. So we'll keep uh, an eye on that and we'll add any uh, logs and bring those uh, onto the log and we'll bring those to the board at each meeting as we're made aware of any. Um, complaint log. In the period July to September, we've had, we haven't had any official complaints from firefighters. We are still receiving um, grumblings, should we call it, um, about the cloud uh, remedy estimate requests. Uh, there's a lot of firefighters asking for estimates, but at the moment with um, COVID and the way the team is working, we're having to focus on uh, immediate retirements, uh, death payment of death benefits, um, and we've um, had central government guidance to confirm that that's what we should be 
focusing our time on and therefore we're not able to provide estimates at this stage and I know that is frustrating for firefighters but we simply at the moment are not resourced to provide estimates to 2021 2022 we just we just can't do it so we continue to go back with that most people seem to accept it and I'll make the fire authority aware of anybody that feels particularly strongly about it. Thank you, Matt. Um, as, as chair of the board, I've recently had um, some meetings with the um, FBU union and um, myself and Debbie has, have met with those and talked about some communication to members to try and reduce some of the pressure on yourself and your team with queries, um, particularly queries that cannot be answered at this point in time. And um, I'll be working with Debbie to produce some regular communications that will run past the uh, pension administration team um, to all members to just reduce some of that pressure. And we've got the support from the FBU there who will also be communicating the same messages to their members. So we're just trying to reduce some of that uh, communication traffic to yourselves whilst you're trying to progress with some of this work. Thank you. The next item is um, IDRPs. Uh, again, in the last quarter, we haven't received any new um, complaints under the disputes resolution procedure. So next thing is any other business. Um, COVID-19 still having quite a significant impact on the team. We have the majority of the team still working at home with nine um, in County Hall on a rotor basis to to try and minimise minimise the effects on business continuity, we still have um, a, a large reliance on printing, post, uh, phone calls into the team. So the ones in the team in the in County Hall are trying to manage that, while those at home are trying to get on with business as usual. The difficulty is, um, so all the calculations that they do have to get sent back into the team to be printed, to be checked, to be sent out, and it's far less efficient than them being in the office. So we're still trying to work on um, ways to become more efficient while we're at home. Um, so yeah, we'll just keep uh, keep plugging away really. Uh, the next big deadline for us is the Government Actu Actuaries Department need valuation data for the 2020 valuation, and the deadline for getting that to GAD is the 31st of December. But I think we're pretty confident now of um, getting the data to them for that deadline. Next item is member self-service. Um, it hasn't really moved on at all during COVID. Now we have sent out the annual benefit statements. We've sent out the annual allowance statements. Once all that begins to die down, then the next step for us is to try and get the training done. And then hopefully we can start rolling member self-service out to OSCE members because that will help, particularly with those estimates that we're being asked for, we can do. Thanks, Matt. How will um, member self-serve be uh, affected with the new national guidance around McLeod? Um, because it will, I, I imagine it will have to be reconfigured with whatever we need to look at in relation to that. Yeah, it will. I mean, anybody who isn't an immediate detriment case, it will still just produce figures based on the regs as they stand. So transitioning into the 15 scheme. But it, you know, the queries that we're getting, people understand that we can't do anything post McLeod, but they still want an estimate, even though we're telling them it isn't accurate of what the real benefits are they're going to receive. I think people just want the reassurance that they can see some figures. Uh, and if they can go into a, their own system and do estimates to different ages, it, I think it just helps to reassure people. But yeah, it's going to be, we'll finally get it live and then we'll probably have to take it down again while we get the cloud sorted. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, moving on. Um, pensionable pay court case. This is still another piece of work that we need to look at. Um, we have started to examine the effects of this judgment and I think there will be a number of firefighters in Cornwall that will be affected by this. And we will be having to do some retrospective work to put their benefits correct. As, as yet unsure of exactly how many that will impact on or what status they are, as in they may already have retired. So we may have to be looking at reworking benefits in payment. But yeah, that is another piece of work that my team's going to have to be looking at in the near future. 
Yeah, and I think just in relation to that, I think that gives extra weight to the risk regarding capacity because it's yet another um, piece of work on top of an ever increasing workload. Next is the annual benefit statements. Now we did actually manage to get these out by the statutory deadline of 31st of August. I think they went out on the 27th, but um, all active um, and deferred members of all the schemes, 92, 2006, modified and 2015 all received a statement and that's both for Cornwall and the Yards of Scilly. So we met that deadline. This will be the last year of producing them from data from ERP. So I think next year will be a whole new challenge with trying to get this information out of the cloud and from a cloud. So yeah, it could be an interesting year for statements. So I'm glad we got them all out on time this year because next year could be more of a challenge. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Just a, a couple of things from me regarding that. Um, I think firstly, a uh, huge thanks to your team that have been under a lot of pressure this summer and with COVID to actually get those annual benefit statements out on time is, is no mean feat really. So a big thank you to you and your team for that. You. Um, and secondly, I'm wondering whether we need to place the, the risk on the risk register with your concerns for the annual benefit statements for next year. Um, particularly in light of a new system which we are experiencing ongoing challenges with at the current time. Um, so I, I just think there, there will be difficulties, I have no doubt, in getting the right information, quality information um, to produce those benefit statements on time next year. Okay. Does anybody else have anything um, to add in relation to that? No. Kath. Yeah, I suppose it, it is a bit of a reiteration of everything we've done before, um, but is there something that we could, I'm thinking maybe get out in a Chiefs comms perspective, just in and around the, uh, could we just basically do a piece around the, the difficulties in, the predictions and the uh, uh, and I know we've done this, um, but I don't know if we could almost kind of time it and phase it in. You know, we know that we're potentially going to have um, those difficulties at the end of the year and almost put in a, a comms plan to preempt those uh, that increased interest that, that people are going to have. Yeah, I don't think I'd like to say anything about next year's statements being late yet. Um, we normally get the year end information in sort of April, May, and at that stage we will we will have a look at the accuracy and yeah, we will we will be open and honest and we will tell you as early as we can if we feel like we're not going to be getting those statements out um, on time. Obviously that's still six months away yet and the cloud could be working perfectly by Who then. Knows? Who knows? That's a fair point. A fair yes. point. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Chair, it's just in and around that if the if our uh, if our thoughts become or our potential kind of thoughts become the realization, then I think we need to be massively on the front foot with our yeah. comms to support our staff. So, yeah, yeah no, thank you both. Yeah, because we sent yeah. out um, communications prior to sending out the statements just to make people aware that it wasn't going to take account of remedy, yeah. because I think people were were under the misapprehension that because everything was moving fast, we would be providing statements on that basis and we could still be in the position next year where it won't take account of McLeod again. So yeah, we'll make sure that we uh, we do communicate that as early as we can. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's helpful actually. If if um, I, I like the idea of a forward plan of communications because um, myself and, and Debbie have talked around regular com uh, communications regarding where we are with pensions. But if we get a good forward plan in place and be proactive, it may reduce some of that um, reactive um, short notice requests that you and your team receive, Matt. OK. Might not, but might. <laughs> yeah. We can try. Yeah. Um, next item is the annual allowance pension saving statements. Now, I don't know how much you all um, know about the annual allowance, but it's a limit that HMRC um, have on how much someone's pension saving, uh, pension benefits can increase in dur during the year. Now it's measured by capitalising the increase in someone's pension 
from the 6th of April to the next 5th of April. And we multiply that increase by 16. So a pension really only has to increase by a few thousand pounds for the uh, annual allowance to become a problem. Uh, firefighters who are still in the 92 scheme, if they've got accelerated accrual, it's actually quite easy with a small pay rise to, to hit that uh, annual allowance. Now, by the 6th of October every year, we have to write to every scheme member who's breached that annual allowance. So again, this is quite a significant piece of work to run a test on every scheme member and then sift through those and send out pension saving statements. Uh, this year, only one firefighter exceeded the annual allowance and didn't have sufficient carry forward from previous years. And carry forward means that if you haven't breached in the previous three years, you've got unused allowances, they could be carried forward to offset a breach in a particular year. And as I say, only one firefighter this year breached and has a tax charge. Any excess over the annual allowance that isn't negated by carry forward, you're taxed on at your marginal rate. So effectively it's added to your pay and you have to declare it through self-assessment. In, in 2019, uh, we wrote to two. So it's uh, only one this year. Uh, six exceeded the annual allowance, um, but had sufficient carry forward to ne fully negate the tax charge. So they didn't, they got a letter, but they didn't actually have uh, anything to pay. And in 2019, that was 10. So this year there were less people in involved in this. Uh, potentially that's probably because we've got more people in the 15 scheme. So we've got less people in the final salary schemes. So an increase in pay in the care scheme isn't as significant as it is if you're still accruing benefits in the in a final salary arrangement. Uh, normally we send warning letters as well to everybody that's had pension savings over 35,000 just to give them, uh, just to make them aware that the annual allowance exists and to say that they haven't got a lot of carry forward. So if they're going to have pay rises in the future that they this could come in. Uh, unfortunately, this year, as it's not a statutory requirement, we haven't done that. We just simply haven't had the resource to send out the warning letters. Um, Thank you, Matt. Uh, just picking up on your point there around um, seeing less, obviously with McLeod and more people potentially going back into the 92, that, yep. that could have the adverse effect. Correct. We'll have to go back now and uh, we work everybody's annual allowance test back to 2015 in the legacy schemes. If they go back to the legacy schemes, obviously if they make the election to stay where they are, we don't have to look at it again. But all the rest will have to reopen all the pension input periods and effectively go back and do five years worth of testing. And yeah, they could. There could be some previous years where people haven't been charged. Um, the next item is the uh, fire and rescue response to the uh, consultation on remedy. Do you, we said we'd do a verbal update at this one, um, particularly because we've obviously sent that in. Do you want to pick it up at this point? Yeah, happy to do so. I've, I've got the uh, response in front of me if everybody's happy for me to read out our response. Um, basically, there has been um, pensions remedy project consultation and we've provided a response on behalf of the um, administering authority, which is Cornwall Council and also Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service. So um, I met with Matt and we have collectively sent forward a response, which is mainly uh, supportive of the scheme advisory boards um, response that has been forward already. So the key elements of the consultation is around whether we would prefer an immediate choice or a deferred choice for members in relation to remedy. Um, our preference has been in line with the scheme advisory board response with the deferred uh, choice underpin being preferable. And this is due to a number of reasons. Um, the minimisation of further legal challenge, whereby um, a member feels they have made the wrong choice at retirement. Um, the difficulty of making decisions based on the complexity of the current schemes and also uncertainty um, of what the future holds. Um, challenges in predicting the future for members when faced with an immediate choice option. Concern regarding the availability of resources and consistency for locally administered schemes. 
and acknowledging that potential costs seem higher to administer the deferred um, choice. This would be undertaken over a prolonged period, enabling efficiencies and improved working practices to be put in place over this time. So that has been really the emphasis of the response um, to the consultation. We've also just raised concerns regarding capacity and time of locally administered schemes, and we have um, emphasised that in our response. And there was also a question um, in the consultation regarding annual benefit statements with a suggestion that there would be two statements provided. And um, our suggestion has been that that is complex, it's time consuming, and we would suggest that there would just be one annual benefit statement reflecting the default legacy scheme or the member's choice only. So that's really a brief summary of the response that we've provided um, on, on our behalf, really, for our scheme. Is there anything else you want to add to that, Matt? No, thanks, Vicky. That's, that's yeah, absolutely spot on. I mean, I think the deferred, the main benefit of the deferred option is that when people are making their selections, they know where they are, they know what their pay has been, and they will have two lots of benefits to compare, and it will be a simple decision. Making a decision now would involve a lot of assumptions over their future uh, working careers, and there is a risk of people making the wrong choice and a risk of further claims in the future. So I think mm. all other points aside, I think that's the strong enough reason to, to go uh, with the recommendation of the deferred option. Mm, yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments regarding our response to the consultation? <laughs> no. Okay. Right. That's um, that's it for my, uh, my report. So it's back to uh, the recommendation. Thank you, Matt. Before we move on to the recommendation, does anybody have any comments to make regarding the report? Yeah. Um, not, not just. I, I suppose yes to, to all of it in its totality, but specifically um, our feedback on the on the consultation, if that's okay, Chair. Um, I obviously know you know it it, it came on behalf of, of ourselves, and um, you know obviously yourself uh, put that together. But again, just um, formal recognition really of the the work that would have gone into that, and the support again provided by Matt and his team in relation to the. Um, to the gathering of that information. I think it's all easy to say, isn't it? Of, you know, we put together our formal uh, response in, in line with that consultation, but I just want it formally uh, recognised that, that that doesn't just happen on a, on a kind of a wing and a prayer. It's indeed uh, an awful amount of professional work and expertise, and for that we're grateful. So thank you to Matt and your team and to yourself, Chair. Thank you, Kath. Okay, so moving on to the recommendation from the report, uh, the recommendation is that the members of the board note the update provided within the business update report and seek from officers such clarifications or further assurances as they require. So um, I need a proposer and a second, uh, please, if you could put an X in the box. I have proposed by Debbie and seconded by Stuart. So if I could go over to Lynn, please, for the roll call. Thank you, Chairman. Catherine Billing, for against or abstain, please. Catherine Billing, for. Debbie Goodread. Debbie Goodread, for. Gary Rich. Gary Rich, for. Victoria Wallens Hancock. Victoria Wallens Hancock for. And Stuart Whitworth. Stuart Whitworth for. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. So moving on to agenda item number five, please. And I'm going to pass over to Matthew Allen for the training update, please. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Vicky. Uh, just to literally take you quickly through the report, if you want to go to Appendix 1, please, and towards the end of the document, obviously just to highlight that it is 15 credits over two years, and they can be built up from completion of uh, TPR courses or 
pensioners, regulators, online courses or toolkits, attendance at conferences, training events like we had just before this meeting, that will obviously go count towards your credits. But just to look, really look at the back page, um, or number four, you'll see that um, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, ambers, um, and a couple of reds and one green, that's you, Vicky. Um, but what I want to, I don't really want to highlight necessarily the, the reds or the ambers. I just want to really, if I can, highlight where the credits are being lost at the moment. So for the historical members who have been, say historically, not here since the year dot, but since um, the board was set up and latterly over the last couple of years, their credits are now starting to drop off because as we've mentioned before, that once you, it's a rolling two year period. So once you hit that date two years down the line, so you'll see some of these courses end in 2018 or start in 2018, they're now dropping off because we're coming now to the two year anniversary. So this is why some people on the last meeting, we would have had maybe green or amber, they're now starting to move the other way down. So there's a quick resolution to it, and that applies to literally, I think, across to everyone. And that is just to go back in and do the, I would say, the TPR, the trustee toolkit, if you can. Um, obviously, it brings time to do that. And that will then start to increase your credits again. Now, obviously, I've got a record of all the ones that you've done and which ones have dropped off. But I would say if you see in the end column where it says the lapse details, they're the ones that are dropping off at the moment. So I would say concentrate on those ones first. And then if you're not sure which ones you've already completed, when you complete those, it'll bring up on a screen which ones you've done and when, so that will help you do those. So they will be easy to pick up. Um, they're the ones I would say crack on with. Um, now, obviously, you also get reading material uh, scored just to keep you up to date with that as well. That's slightly different because what you can do, you can read as much as you want and we, we want to encourage you to do that, but you can only get a maximum of six credits per two years. And all of you that are on the call today have all achieved that already. So you've already read your six credits worth of material. But the way I'm working it is as one drops off, you're in credit with others. So I'll put those back into the list. So for the majority of you, and in fact, all of you that are here today, you've got points in the bag ready for when those drop off for the reading material. But that's separate away from the ordinary material, the ordinary training that we've mentioned a minute ago with TPR toolkit. Bottom line is, I think you're, you're all keeping up to date and obviously the newer members, they're only starting now to get their points on the board. Uh, again, some of those have already completed the trustee toolkit, some haven't. But what I would suggest to do is have a look at the trustee toolkit first for all of you, whether you're a new or old member on the board. Just go in, see which ones you need to complete, which ones you haven't completed and which ones may be dropping off soon um, and get those done. And then we are, you'll see then all those potentially red and ambers moving in the other direction. Um, but that's really it really, just to highlight those really, you know, I'm not greatly concerned because I think they're all easily achievable from what I can see. And that's it. Thank you, Matt. Um, really useful report. And um, what I particularly like about the report is, is where the credits are dropping off because I think that gives um, board members uh, an area of focus. So thank you for that. That's a really useful um, update to the report. So um, it's just really an, an ask um, for everybody on the board just to make sure that um, we are going in um, to the uh, toolkit and updating yourselves with those modules. Um, obviously, it does take time, so um, just do it when you can do it, but um, it'll be really useful to uh, keep your skills and knowledge up to date um, to prepare for this board. A um, bit of a question for you, Matt, actually, from myself, because yeah. there are a couple of members of this board that are involved quite a lot in some um cases at the moment actually that are impacting on pensions and are having regular meetings and and as a result of that um myself included actually my pensions knowledge has just had to shoot up significantly to to kind of get our heads around um some of the challenges that are being faced at the moment and i'm just wondering whether um those meetings that we are having because we are talking quite in depth around some of the issues around pensions, whether that can be put towards the training, because we're kind of indirectly um, improving our knowledge in the area. I think it's a good question. Um, I'm just literally, uh, as we're speaking, just trying to have a look at what 
the, uh, the actual strategy says, because I think at the moment, I don't think there is a direct link to actually add those in, but I'm going to just quickly have a look. Um, so we are saying that uh, TPR toolkit SIPFA, attendance training event organised by the fund, attendance approved conference, completion of reading material. I would say at the moment, it's not built into that strategy. Now, whether we need to review that strategy, I think, you know, maybe maybe we look at that again and incorporate that if, like you said, there, there's so much work going into it. Or maybe it comes under potentially the reading material side and maybe mm -hmm. the, the research that you're doing and going out is actually the reading material side. Um, we can maybe add it into there as well because it's pension related. But for actual, if you like, the meetings, for getting direct credits one for one, if you like, on those. At the moment, the strategy is not allowing you to do that. But I'm not saying we can't not review it. Yeah, the one thing I was thinking, Matt, is like the some of the meetings we've had recently, we've almost had to provide the training yes. event before the meeting Yeah. to get those at the meeting up to speed with what we're going to discuss. Mm. I think so, I think in those cases, I think, yeah, I mean, obviously, it, cause I think the strategy way it's written at the moment, I think if it's delivered by us, then that does count. So I would say yeah. if you have us on and call beforehand or advising any of you, I would say, yeah. I would say, yeah. And all I'd say on anything, even if you think it is or isn't, send it to me straight away and then yeah. I'll come back to you and let you know yes or no. I'd rather be told everything than nothing. Um, but yeah, definitely send them to me and I'll obviously try and where I can slot it in the strategy. But as you said, maybe further down the line, we review the strategy again. If we if we find that the credits aren't being met or you feel as though it's not achieving what you want, yeah. Yeah. I think Thank that's you. the key in it, Matt. Yeah. Mm. It is it's a it's a it's a developing document. It's not going to sit there for four years and not be looked at. That's the whole point really. And as you know, we've reviewed it fairly recently anyway. So I think we we need to be constantly review like we do with everything else. And if that's one of the things we bring in, no problem at all. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. That's really helpful. Are there any comments or questions for Matt regarding the training report? No, nope. so I'll move to the recommendation that the members of the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly Fire Rescue Services Local Pension Board note the update provided within the report. So I'm looking for a proposer and a seconder for those. If you could put an X in the box, please. So it's proposed by Stuart and second by Debbie. And I will move over to Lynn for the roll call, please. Thank you, Chairman. Catherine Billing, for, against or abstain? Catherine Billing, for. Debbie Goodread. Debbie Goodread, for. Gary Rich. Gary Rich, for. Victoria Wallens Hancock. Victoria Wallens Hancock, for. Stuart Whitworth. Stuart Whitworth, for. Thank you. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. So moving on to agenda item six, any business the chair cons uh, considers to be urgent um, have no urgent items. So that draws the meeting to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.